Um, this is really fun. And um, we're so delighted that you're here, Michael and Nick. Um, and what a turnout. Everyone wanted to see you. So it's a good thing. Um, one little side, we have a board member sitting smiling. She's been married now three weeks and she speaks Armenian and we were going to have it all covered today. <laughs> but uh, we're so sorry that uh, your cohort couldn't make it. One other thing you need to know, we're all sitting very close. I'm sure we're all inoculated. We installed a filter system, filtration system in our building. Um, it's 98.3%, but it's equivalent of an uh, operating room or an airplane. <laughs> air that circulates through here. So please feel safe and comfortable. Um, some can't stay, of course. Uh, I know there are distinguished guests we have to move on shortly after three, uh, but we're gonna have a little uh, refreshments right at three, they'll, they'll bring them in. And we can all socialize then. Uh, we've even opened a couple of bottle of wines. So um, we do have, a friend of mine, he happens to be an ambassador. Um, once you're an ambassador, you're an ambassador for life, I think, isn't that how that works? In the American system, but not in the UK. Oh, really? <laughs> we could learn a lot. I think. <laughs> in this as in many areas. <laughs> so Kevin O'Malley and I were actually fraternity brothers on separate Jesuit campuses. <laughs> and uh, he was the ambassador to Ireland uh, under President Obama. And of course, when there was an election, then he was no longer. Now that happens in the United States. Once there's an election, I think you lose your job if, you, if you, the president doesn't. Uh, so, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis. And uh, please have at it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Deputy Ambassador Latham, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time to visit St. Louis. And I want to thank my colleague, Mark Sutherland, uh, Honorary Counsel of the UK. Mark and I sit adjacent to each other. Uh, in our office at the Missouri Partnership. So thanks, Mark, for pulling this together. My instructions today were to conduct a conversation on UK foreign policy and to prepare. I read this document entitled Global Britain in a Competitive Age, the Integrated Review of the Security, <laughs> Defense, Development, and Foreign Policy written in March 2021. It's a snappy title. It's a snappy title, <laughs> yes. Can, can you <laughs> describe what this integrated review is and, and how it impacts your daily life as a foreign policy maker or in, impl implementer? Yeah, no, I can. Um, the, I'm just going to call it the integrated review, uh, if, I, if I can. I think it is a very uh, significant statement um, of, of UK uh, foreign policy, and I think it actually provides me with a very good structure and, and, and foundation uh, for these, uh, these remarks. Um, uh, a former U.S. Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, you know, famously said in a way that was rather sort of wounding for us Brits that the U, you know, the U.K. has lost an empire but hasn't found uh, a role. Um, uh, and I think that sort of poses a question of, you know, we, we found a role uh, for the U.K. Uh, as a leading member of the European Union. Then we left the European Union. Uh, and what is the U.K.'s international role outside uh, the European Union? Very good question, and I think the answer is uh, is largely to be found in the uh, the integrated review. Um, I think what the integrated review does is it it dispels this idea that was never accurate that the UK leaving the EU was about the UK turning in upon itself uh, and becoming introspective. Um, Brexit was uh, about leaving the EU. It was about the readjustment of our relations with other European countries, but it was never uh, a statement of wanting the UK to be anything other than an internationally engaged uh, and, uh, and active country. And although the EU was an important multilateral framework for us while we were a member of it, there are many others in which we are uh, very actively and centrally engaged, such as a G7, such as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the UN um, as uh, the, the leading European military contributor to, uh, to, to NATO. Um, and you see, I think, that aspiration to continued, even intensified uh, international leadership this year with the UK 
uh, chairing uh, the, the G7, uh, which is a particular international responsibility um, this year as, as the G7 tries to coordinate on stimulating uh, an economic recovery uh, after the pandemic. And then possibly an even bigger international responsibility when we chair the COP26 summit on climate change at the end of this year in Glasgow, where uh, under combined UK and Italian leadership, we will be hoping uh, to shape a, a really impactful international response to this, this huge issue uh, that, uh, that, that, that confronts us. To come back to the integrated uh, review, I think there are two things that are, are, are special about it, um, if you like. The first, and here the, the clue is, uh, is, is in the title, um, it genuinely is integrated. Um, I think in the past we have had security reviews and defense reviews that focus very much on the, the defense security prism. This review is gen, genuinely integrated um, in that it addresses both national security and the wider international context, issues like trade, issues like climate, issues like some of these transnational uh, threats that we, um, uh, that we confront. So in that sense, I think it is, is very interesting. And then it's also striking to come back to what I was saying earlier, because it is the first big review since our departure uh, from the European Union. So it is an opportunity to set out uh, a clear vision of what the UK's international role and aspirations are. I can keep, once I get started on the integrated review, I can sort of keep <laughs> well, going for all literally... All the questions are about the review. Yeah? So we'll, we'll, we'll do, you, do you want to keep asking yeah, questions or do you want me to just no, keep... No, keep you're doing great. Like, I'll, I'll ask some questions. Okay, ask me some and, questions. I, and I'm glad you mentioned okay. Dean Atchison's quote because I saw it, but I didn't dare bring it up. No, right? no, no, so, no, no. So I'm glad you, you put that on the table Best there. to get it out of the way on your own terms. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So the, the document reinforces some previous major foreign policy uh, pillars, such as keeping the United States as your key bi bilateral uh, partner, uh, your commitment to NATO, continuing the fight against terrorism and protecting human rights. But it, there are multiple adjustments from the previous plan. And I just wanna highlight three and maybe get your opinions on these three. The first one is shaping the international order of the future. Second one is Europe. And the third one is science and technology. Let's start with uh, shaping the international order. And this is really about you know what's, what's the international system in a post cold war. And so uh, reading from the, from the document, uh, a shift from preserving the post-Cold War rules-based international system to adapt to a more competitive and fluid international environment. So from a British perspective, describe what has happened to this rules-based international system since the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December 1991. And then what does this mean in practical terms is the shift to a, uh, a fluid system or fluid environment? How, what, what's really changing here? Um, really good question. Uh... I think this, this concept of shaping the international order and, and the future, what this comes down to is um, recognizing you know, the, the, the huge value of international and uh, multilateral frameworks and um, you know, the fantastic uh, achievement of, of those countries that were involved in setting that, that 1945 uh, architecture, which was very new and of its time, right? I'll quote Dean Atchison again, president of the creation. Um, Bretton Woods, IMF. Bretton Woods, yeah. IMF. Um, I think the, the, the thinking here in the integrated review is, is, is as hugely important as, though the, as, as those frameworks are. A, a sensible international agenda is not just about um, uh, upholding them, uh, it's about developing them, uh, modernizing them, um, and, uh, and expanding, uh, expanding them. Um, so I think it's about recognizing um, where there are bits of, the, uh, of that longstanding international architecture, um, which are in need of modernization uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and reform. Um, uh, often for very good reason. It's not a criticism of, uh, of the WHO or the WTO to say that, um, uh, you know, we think there are some useful reforms, there's some useful modernization uh, that, that could happen there. 
But I think it's also about this, and this plays to another theme, which we'll probably come to at the integrated review about technological change and, 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 and science and, and innovation. And it's recognizing that we are confronting new challenges that, that people just had no concept of at the time these frameworks were created um, after uh, the Second World War. Um, so cyber, for example, cyber threats, some of these things that are, are very topical uh, at, uh, at the moment. Uh, countries increasingly getting engaged in, in space and the space sector. Um, activity is expanding uh, into these, these new areas and the, the sort of frameworks are not, do not yet uh, exist. They're not yet settled uh, for these areas. But I think as an international community, we would benefit from thinking about what kind of international frameworks um, we want uh, in, in areas such as cyber, in areas such as uh, a space. So it's also about recognizing um, that, uh, that there are a, a, a new challenges that we're confronting, which, which weren't conceived of when, when a lot of this multilateral international architecture was created and thinking about how we either adapt or the, the, the current architecture or create new architecture uh, to, uh, to, to, to deal with them. So that's what I think this sort of shaping the future mm -hmm. is about. And that's how it differs from, from a more straightforward concept of just sort of reinvesting on in, in existing multilateral uh, architecture. And, and, and throughout the document, there are phrases like multi multilateralism, cooperation, international agreements. And so I think that plays to that shaping of the international. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, this next question is going to be no surprise. It's probably a topic you're, you're sick of talking about, but I have to bring it up because it's made such a big part of your document. Uh, Europe. Uh, your, your prime minister wrote that having left the European Union, the United Kingdom has started a new chapter in our history. And so from an from American perspective, what we saw in the press, there's a lot about the potential impact of Brexit, notably that the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland travel and customs and London as a financial hub. So I don't know how you want to answer these questions, but what are your thoughts on Great Britain's relationship with Europe post-Brexit? How has life changed for British citizens? How does, it, how does this impact your foreign policy goals? And then what updates can you provide to us on the, the issues of the, the border, London as a financial hub and, and um, uh, travel? Okay. British citizens. Okay, there's quite a lot to unpack. I know. But let me, let me, <laughs> it's all, it all goes down to let Brexit. Me, let me take them in, in, in turn. Um, first of all, our relations with the, uh, the European Union. Um, it, we, we, we left the EU in a kind of phased, staggered way, right? Initially, we sort of left legally, but remained in a kind of transition uh, period in which, although we had left legally, all of the kind of frameworks continued to apply. And that was sort of essentially designed to give uh, everyone, governments, business, um, breathing spaces to adjust to uh, the changes. And then when that transition period uh, ended, um, uh, while that transition period was going on, we negotiated uh, with the European Union a, uh, a trade and cooperation agreement. And so that was in place at the moment that we left the, uh, the, the, the European Union. Um, I suppose there are two things uh, to say here. The first of all is, is that there was a lot of debate, a lot of really protracted um, and quite turbulent debate in uh, politically turbulent debate in the UK about what form of Brexit um, uh, the, the UK was going to uh, pursue, how we were going to leave the, uh, the European Union. Uh, the government, the, 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 the government that Boris Johnson uh, uh, Leeds that started in the summer of 2019 and then was elected, uh, won the elections in, in December 2019, took the view that it wanted uh, a clear break. Um, and so uh, the, the UK um, left the EU, it left the EU's uh, regulatory framework, it left the EU's judicial uh, uh, framework so that we are no longer sort of subject in any way, direct or indirect, to, uh, uh, to, to EU law. Um, or EU uh, judicial practices. So it was, in that sense, a very uh, clean break because the government made it very clear that its key driver was the, the desire to secure um, UK, uh, UK sovereignty, and it didn't want that impeded in any way by kind of legacy um, connections to, uh, to European Union uh, frameworks. 
And the trade and cooperation agreement is sort of based around, uh, around that. Um, it means that we have left the, uh, the European Union customs uh, union. So there are now customs controls on, uh, on goods passing from the EU to the UK, which is a, uh, a significant change. Although a lot of work has gone on into uh, using IT, created, tr creating trusted trader schemes and so on that can make that, uh, that to, to sort of minimize any potential uh, friction there. However, um, the, the trade and cooperation agreement is far reaching um, in that it is based around zero tariffs, uh, zero quotas. Um, and you know, I think from our perspective in the UK, uh, we feel this is a, is, is a good agreement because it, it gives the UK what we were really looking for, which is, is that sovereignty over our own affairs, including trade. Um, and, but although it marks a sort of clean legal break with the European Union, in practical terms, because of those zero tariffs, zero quota arrangements, it means that we are still, our businesses can still be very connected to, uh, to the countries of the European Union, which makes sense because um, it is a, a huge market for us. It's right on our, uh, it, it's right on our doorstep. Um, so that is um, the, uh, sort of way in which we've um, we've left the uh, the European Union um, for the in financial services mm -hmm. um, sector I think you know we are very confident that London as a, as a big global financial services sector will be able to uh, retain uh, and consolidate its competitive uh, edge um, there are many reasons why it is uh, is it, has advantages and its attractions as a financial services uh, center um, and passporting around the European Union uh, was, was one of them, but not the only one uh, by any means. Uh, the, I think the, the financial services sector was very smart in kind of anticipating uh, the direction that this was likely to go and putting in place a sort of framework of, of, of steps that, that sort of counted in uh, the kind of Brexit um, that, uh, that, that was likely to, uh, to happen. So I think, you know, we're confident that the Financial Services uh, Centre of London will, will continue uh, to prosper um, and that it will defy some of the sort of gloomy um, prognosis. There was a lot of excitement um, uh, earlier this year when uh, the media was reporting that Amsterdam had overtaken London in terms of the volume of, of, of of shares traded. Um, so I was pleased to see earlier this month that, that London has kind of reverted to um, number one uh, position. And I think that is a reflection of its continuing strength. Um, the border. The border. Um, so as the ambassador knows, um, this, is, uh, this is a complex, um, a complex subject, but there is, is one proposition um, uh, which is at the heart of it, which is, is actually not complex at all. It's very simple. And that um, proposition is that the, the Belfast uh, Good Friday uh, Agreement uh, reached in 1998 with, with you know, huge support um, from the then US administration and with strong support from every subsequent US administration. Um, this is a formidable achievement Mm -hmm. um, it lies at the heart of the, uh, the peace process. It remains the basis for um, uh, UK policy. We are strongly and unequivocally uh, committed to it. That is the, uh, the, the starting point, and I sort of cannot say that um, uh, strongly enough. Now, one of the, uh, the, the challenge here um, is that uh, one of the aspects of, of part of the context for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is this concept of, of, of the open border, or concept, it's a reality of an open border um, between Northern Ireland uh, and the Republic of Ireland. That is a key part of the context that has made the Belfast Good Friday Agreement gel uh, and prosper. So the challenge that the UK uh, and the EU has, has, has faced is how do you retain that open border, important for all sorts of reasons, when the UK is no longer part of the European Union Customs Union? So it's, it's an open border, but it's also um, uh, a, a sort of customs border 
between uh, the United Kingdom and the, uh, the European Union. So that was a sort of policy challenge. And there were various kind of uh, proposals for how to, uh, to, to tackle it. Um, and the one that we ended up with uh, is, is reflected in the Northern Ireland Protocol, which gives Northern Ireland this unique status where it is um, uh, essentially part of the European Customs Union for goods flowing from Northern Ireland um, into uh, uh, the, uh, the Republic of Ireland, but also part of the UK's uh, customs uh, union. So that is the that, that is the protocol. Um, uh, it's a complex arrangement, uh, but it is one that um, uh, allows us to maintain the open border between Northern Ireland and the, the, the Republic of Ireland, which is so important for all the reasons that um, uh, that I stated, while also respecting Northern Ireland's position as uh, as part of the uh, United Kingdom. So, so far, that all sounds great. Um, I think I probably, uh, you know, in the interests of, 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 of honesty and openness, I should say that we are experiencing problems with the, uh, the application of the protocol um, uh, in practice, because uh, part of that um, uh, involves a level of, 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 of bureaucracy um, on some goods flowing uh, from uh, Great Britain, the mainland, uh, into to, to Northern Ireland. Um, I think the intention in drawing up the protocol was always that that bureaucracy would be minimized and its impact on, on the public uh, of, of, of Northern Ireland uh, would be reduced as far as possible. I think what we found is that in practice, it is, um, uh, it is having unwelcome impact on the flow of some goods and therefore the availability of some products in Northern Ireland, including medicinal uh, products. So I think there are these um, uh, problems that need to be worked through. And the UK uh, is engaged at the minute um, uh, with the EU and we're in trying to sort of address these problems uh, and find ways uh, forward. And that work will, will, will continue. And you know, the UK is committed to, to making this uh, work um, and to maintaining the, uh, the, the, the open border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland at the same time as we preserve the overall balance of the uh, the Good Friday Agreement, which also has um, an east-west uh, dimension to it. I think I'll stop there. Oh, I, think it's <laughs> it, it, I hope that uh, that wasn't too uh, too confusing no, uh, I think as a summary job. of what is a, uh, a, Open complex, is, yeah. a complex situation. <laughs> but again, I you know I come back to this because at, at the heart of this is you know is the UK's unequivocal. Commitment to the Belfast uh, Good Friday uh, Agreement. That is what brought um, peace to uh, a very troubled part uh, of the United Kingdom. The benefits of that are apparent to everyone, but especially to, to the people of Northern Ireland. And we are determined to, to uphold that. Let's shift to the third adjustment, which is the role of science and technology in the integrated review. And how does science play a role in your foreign policy? Yeah, um, there's several pages in the document about this. I was really struck by that. No, no, I think I think that's right. I think that this is another very striking aspect of the uh, the 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 integrated review. There's a very um, I can't remember the precise wording, but somewhere in the integrated review uh, there is a, a sentence which I remember when I read it. Kind of you know I thought wow that, that, that had strong impact on me, and it says essentially you know a country's um, prowess in, in sort of science and, and technology and innovation is increasingly going to become a metric of its, uh, its international influence uh, and, and standing. And, and it, it was probably put more eloquently uh, than that. Um, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a recognition um, that if, country, if, 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 if the UK or any other country is to thrive, it's going to need to be at the cutting edge of science uh, and, uh, and innovation, um, realizing the benefits that come from that and tackling the challenges um, that, uh, that, that come from that. And so, you know, I think our, our view is that, for, you know, for the UK, maintaining, um, developing uh, its, uh, its reputation as a country which is at the cutting edge of, 
uh, research uh, and innovation as uh, high quality uh, institutions of higher education will be really important uh, for our future. Um, and, uh, and that the more we do that, the stronger uh, we will be, uh, uh, as the stronger and more resilient we will be uh, as a country. So what does that, uh, that translate into uh, in practice? It translates into an increasingly leaning into research and development and the, the integrated review sets uh, an aspiration uh, to, uh, to spend 2.4% of GDP um, on research and development by uh, 2027. Um, it involves creating stronger partnerships in, in science and technology. Um, last month when President Biden uh, met with Prime Minister Johnson in, in Cornwall for the bilateral visit that, that preceded the G7 summit, they agreed a uh, uh, two things, a, a new Atlantic Charter and, uh, and, a, and a joint statement. And, and the sort of new Atlantic Charter, if you like, was a, uh, a high level statement of principles, a joint statement set out some really more concrete areas of, of cooperation. And one was the aspiration to create a UK-US science and technology uh, partnership. So, you know, we very much want to work closely um, with the UK, uh, sorry, with the US um, uh, in this, this space. And it's actually um, relevant for us as, as, uh, as, as diplomats. Now in the, um, in the UK's diplomatic uh, footprint in, uh, in the US, uh, across, you know, covering our embassy and our, our eight consulates, um, we have a network uh, of officers who are focusing on tech uh, engagement. Um, earlier this year, we appointed um, uh, somebody to be double-hatted as, as our consul general in San Francisco, but also uh, the UK's tech envoy um, uh, to the US. Uh, and it was um, someone who came from, from having been uh, a senior business person um, in, in tech based on the, uh, the West Coast. So it's certainly um, you know, leaning into that science tech partnership with uh, with the US is, uh, is really, uh, really important. And it's a, a growth area for, for UK diplomacy in, in the US. One thing that has always struck me about UK foreign policy, and you're, you're, you're known for this, uh, is your official development assistance that you provide to other nations, uh, the soft power. In fact, in the, in the document, they called you a uh, soft power superpower. So do you want to kind of I mean, I, and I'm a, I'm a recipient of your, your soft power. I watch uh, BritBox, I read The Economist, I, I like uh, BBC. So, I mean, I know there's more to that than soft power, but can we look at official development assistance and your role globally? Of, 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 you call it a, actually a, a, a force for good agenda. So I'm curious to hear about that force for good agenda. I think it's well merited uh, with your reputation. Okay, I think I'll try and, and, and uh, split those into three, right? So um, development, soft power, and um, uh, force for good. Um, and I'll start with, uh, with, with, with development. Um, and, and here, I think what I, I would want to say is, it, you know, and this has been a trend over several years and several governments of governments um, wanting the UK um, to, to be at the forefront of international development um, and wanting our contribution to be as, as, as sizable and, and high quality uh, as possible. And so you know, the successive governments took a series of legislative uh, steps um, that, that created a, a legislative requirement um, for the UK to meet, I think it's a UN target of 0.7% mm -hmm. of, of, of GDP being spent on, uh, on development. So there was this trend over several years of the UK leaning into uh, to its development work, um, if you like, culminating in that, that legal obligation to, to, to meet the 0.7% uh, target. Um, I say legal obligation, but um, there was actually a little bit of small print that um, uh, sort of created provision for exceptional circumstances. And um, in the government's view, the, the, the pandemic um, and the, the sort of huge public spending pressures that have um, arisen as a result of that constitute um, one of those 
pressures. So in, in the short term, and as a temporary measure, um, we have actually um, decided to reduce that, that 0.7% commitment to 0.5%. But two things uh, I will say. Firstly, even that reduced proportion of 0.5% still leaves us as one of the largest uh, international donors, um, uh, uh, largest donors and, and a major development uh, presence. And secondly, the government has been very clear that as and when economic circumstances allow, and in the last week, we've tried to create a little bit more precision uh, around, uh, around that. Our intention is firmly um, to, to get back as quickly as possible to, um, to, to that 0.7% uh, target. So on, on development, um, you know, this is an area where um, you know, the UK has a high level uh, of ambition, and wants to maintain its profile as a, as a major international uh, development um, player. Um, what were the other two? Force for good. Force for good, force soft, for good and, good uh, and, and, and soft power. Um, I'm often, I'm often asked, um, do you, there's this, the UK, US, and people talk about the special relationship. And interestingly, um, some British ambassadors in Washington think this is a great phrase and they, they love it and use it the whole time. Other British ambassadors don't like it. They think it sort of speaks to a, a neediness or whatever and, 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 and don't use it. My view um, is, uh, is, to, is to, to use the phrase in the sort of spirit of show, not tell, right? Isn't this the show me state? It is a show me state. state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's an appropriate thing to say. Um, <laughs> uh, and by what I mean about that is don't just sort of assert the, the special relationship, you know, blandly at every opportunity in a way that dilutes its impact. Use a phrase where there really is a special dimension uh, to the relationship. And there are many areas where it is special that the cooperation between our armed forces, our in, in, in intelligence agencies, the very close diplomatic cooperation between our two countries. But what, another area where I do think the, um, uh, the, the special relationship really is special is in the soft power people to people um, space. And I'm always, I, what I always find is that whenever I'm uh, I'm meeting, I'm, I'm at an event like this. I was, okay, this morning, um, Mark organized a great session with business representatives from St. Louis. And as we did the table round, it just sort of struck me how many people had, uh, you know, a sister who was living in, uh, in Derby in the UK, that their spouse was uh, British, that they'd studied at the London School of, of, of okay. Economics. So they worked for an international company and had four, you know, happy years working for the the UK uh, subsidiary. Every year in DC, we hold an open day um, at our embassy where members of the public can, um, can, can come in and see the, the residents and the, uh, the gardens. And, and my job is always to be there at the front gate, meeting everyone as they come in. And, and I'm always struck by how many people want to talk to me about you know, why that they feel some special connection with the UK and it's mutual. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think that exactly the same is true of the uh, the UK public, um, and also I think we are as a country um, we um, we are lucky in that we you know we have a thriving cultural sector which exports literature, um, movies, really music, really yeah. well, movies, actors, um, uh, music, um, and we're especially lucky um, that uh, you know for that there is huge interest in UK sport. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think the, um, the, 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 the concept of being a soft power superpower is recognizing that we're very lucky, um, to enjoy, uh, those, um, uh, those sort of assets in terms of international, uh, influence and, 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 and being sort of thinking, making sure that you're, you're harnessing those in as, 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 as a sort of smarter way, uh, as, uh, as possible and never taking it for granted and never taking it uh, and never taking it uh, for granted yeah. um, and uh, and I actually you know it, it's um, and then history as well sort of shared history is is is, is, is another point. I remember, hiccups, but, uh, yeah I remember yeah. when um, uh, 
2017, when I, I, I started in, in DC in, in January 2018. So I was preparing to come um, to, uh, to, to the US and I was doing a lot of sort of work researching the US politics and economics and so on. So that I felt if anyone ever asked me questions when I, at the first reception I attended, I would have sort of intelligent <laughs> answers to give. And I remember when I did arrive in January 2018, the question that everyone was asking me was, who is the better Churchill? Is it Gary Oldman in The Darkest Hour <laughs> or is it John Lithgow in, uh, in The Crown? Uh, and I think that, that sort of speaks to um, uh, how, uh, how UK culture uh, yeah. and history is a real asset for us um, yeah. uh, in, our, in our work. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't possibly answer that, that, that question. No comment. Comment. You, you mentioned the. So I haven't for, oh, finished. No, no, no. Of course oh, we're sorry. good. <laughs> of course we're good. Um, of course we're good. Yes. Uh, this is a phrase that um, that uh, that the UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab I think attaches a lot of importance to, um, and uh, well, I think he has a he has a background as uh, as, as a lawyer who has specialised in, in in human rights um, and international. Uh, law. And um, one of the things that, um, that leaving the EU means is it gives us greater scope for agility and speed in our foreign policy making. When something happened while we were a member of the EU, um, you know, very often the sort of first question that we were asking ourselves is, is how do we shape the EU common position mm -hmm. uh, on this. Um, how can we persuade the European Union to agree uh, 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 on the sort of level of sanctions that we think is, is proportionate, warranted um, to this? Once you've, uh, and that could, you know, involve then negotiations between, you know, over two dozen uh, countries that could could be protracted and, and, and painful. And I know that because I, I took part in some of them, and where often the sort of dynamic of that kind of negotiation amongst many countries is that you sort of settle on a, on on a, on on, on uh, an outcome which is you know maybe less ambitious than uh, than you would want. So I think a, a lot of this force for good thinking is about how can you use that agility um, and that scope for speedy decision making in a in a positive way. And I think you know examples of, 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 of this in action. We now have a, uh, a national um, sanctions regime related, uh, connected to, to, to human rights uh, abuses. Um, it's very similar actually to legislation that the US has put in place and it's similarly referred to as Magnitsky mm -hmm. um, uh, legislation. And that allows us uh, to, to move uh, you know, very swiftly and decisively when we think that sanctions uh, are, are warranted. Um, and that has been the case um, uh, in recent months, for example, in respect of, of Belarus. And I think, you know, you by being the, the first mover, I think you then um, start to get a different form of influence. You start to be the country that is moving quickly and setting the terms of the, uh, of the, the debate. So it, so I think force of good is about thinking how you can use that agility um, to uphold international standards around democracy and, uh, and, and human rights, um, to be swift and responsive when something happens internationally uh, that you think um, warrants uh, action. Other areas where I think you, you, you've seen that, that sort of the UK applying that force for good philosophy, for example, in Hong Kong, in offering a pathway to UK citizenship uh, for holders of, of British national overseas passports in some of the measures that we have, uh, have, have, have taken uh, designed to, uh, to, to, to combat use of forced labor in, 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 in Xinjiang. Um, it connects to, uh, to those development aspirations um, that, uh, that I talked about. Um, it involves the UK, I think, now looking to take up a campaigning role on issues like gender equality, girls' education, uh, and, uh, and media freedom. So uh, that, I think, is, is um, uh, 
uh, what they, that, that sort of force for good descriptor is looking to, to capture. Well, we have a lot more topics, but not enough time. So okay. let me throw out five more themes and you can pick which one you want to address. Okay. All right. okay. I'll, I'll go for the easiest. Then. Economic statecraft, green industrial revolution, space, serious and organized crime, and the Arctic region. Okay. I think I will go for, for, for green industrial um, revolution. I think because um, that connects to what is really a key priority um, for, for the UK government and for UK uh, foreign policy, um, which is climate change. Um, so the, the green industrial um, revolution, I think is, it's about wanting to see the climate challenge as, as an opportunity. Um, uh, and also wanting to sort of make sure that as we focus on the need to stimulate economic recovery after the shock that all our economies have taken um, from the pandemic, we look to do that in a way which is, is, is climate responsible. Um, we look to uh, adopt recovery policies um, that are, uh, are green and, uh, and, and climate uh, friendly. Um, the UK has, um, uh, has set itself uh, an ambitious uh, legislative uh, target of getting to net zero um, by uh, 2050. We have set ourselves an ambitious um, uh, nationally determined contribution uh, for, 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 for COP26. Um, and you know, we are now uh, committed to achieving those goals. Um, and we, you know, we think that it's possible to do that in a way which is, which combines a green climate friendly approach with the promotion of, of economic growth. In, uh, you know, since 1990, our emissions have fallen um, by over 40% at the same time as our economy has grown um, by over, over 70%. Uh, so, uh, we, and we want to continue that trend. And we think that economics uh, are on our side here, because actually, you know, one of the really positive things that's happening in this space is that the cost of renewables is falling. It is becoming much cheaper now to uh, uh, embrace uh, and develop renewable forms of energy. And I, you know, there's a, a great example I always like to quote is the, the UK North Sea. When I was a kid, um, I guess, you know, around eight, nine, 10. I just remember there was sort of so much excitement in uh, the UK around North Sea oil and, and gas. Everyone thought that was a sort of basis for the UK's uh, economic future. There was a lot of excitement for it. Aberdeen sort of took off as a basis for the North Sea energy um, sector. There were board games called North Sea Oil. As a kid, you had these sort of model helicopters that were flying people on and off. Uh, oil rigs. Um, now, uh, the North Sea, again, we look to as, as a, a key part of our energy future, but because of wind, um, uh, it offers not just the North Sea, but the, the entire UK uh, coast offers huge potential uh, for, for renewable wind energy. And I think I'm right in saying that one third of, of, of global wind energy is now happening in, uh, in, uh, in the UK. So I don't want to sound naive, but I think and, and, you know, the, the, the tension between uh, economic growth, which of course any government will, will uh, be wanting to uh, achieve and pursuing green climate friendly uh, policies is, 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 is reducing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think clean growth, uh, clean energy growth uh, is gonna provide real economic uh, opportunities uh, for uh, for the future, and um, you know, my government has a uh, an ambitious agenda of looking to uh, to deliver those. And and the prime minister in November, I think, talked about a, a green ten point plan, which contained you know, many uh, many many elements, including creating what, what we call green collar jobs, jobs mm -hmm. that are generated by investing in uh, in in renewables. 
Um, also, I think strikingly recognizing the important transport um, dimension to this. So in 2030, uh, I think at that point, uh, you know, in the UK, it will not be possible to buy a new car um, that is running on oil uh, or, gas yeah. or gas, which I think is a very um, uh, you know, striking uh, policy uh, commitment um, to make. But I think I'm pretty sure it will be, uh, you know, an effective an effective measure. I will be going back to the UK when I finish this posting at some point, probably in 2022. And when I take decisions about what car I'm going to buy, I'm going to be thinking I'll probably want it to be one that's going to value is going to mm -hmm. hold up in, uh, in, 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 in the future. So I think it will have real impact, not just in 2030, but in casting a sort of shadow uh, forward over decisions that, that, um, that people take. Deputy Ambassador Tatham, you per personify the special relationship that we have with, with the United Kingdom. We appreciate your time today. We wish you a very pleasant stay in St. Louis and you're always welcome to come back, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, everyone coming, I always, whenever I'm, I'm traveling around um, the US, I always say to our consulate or honorary consulate, please connect me to the World Affairs Council. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to, to engage with you, especially grateful for so, for so many people um, for coming today. It's a pleasure to be meeting in, in person uh, again and to be seeing you all in three dimensions. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you very much, a uh, real pleasure to come here. And uh, I hope that I will be back in St. Louis, but even if I'm not, um, uh, I hope that other members of the embassy and at some point our ambassador will, will make it here. And when they do, I'm sure they'll want to meet with you all again. Wonderfully said. Um, thank you. As you've come to know us intimately, intentionally, this is a small group. May we call you Michael? You may, of course. Okay. So uh, the connection, Michael, as we go through, and we have board members, board members, um, Bunzel. Bunzel's trade, as you know, on the FTSE. Bunzel is well related here. Um, we have a man over here, and Noonan, who would talk about um, preservation of uh, green things. He has a company right here in St. Louis that takes used um, plastic bags and turns them into railroad ties. The last for very long time. Forever. Forever. <laughs> um, we, we have, uh, of course, we just, uh, you can go on and on. Everyone here has a connection, either through business or uh, the World Affairs Council. Uh, Don Rubin heads up uh, BioSTL, and you've been down to Cortex. Uh, this really is, um, I think that the, the, the gentleman in San Francisco should consider moving here because we really are a hub for a lot of ag, a lot of science, uh, high technology. Uh, Square was invented here. I think Twitter may have been too. So uh, we're very proud of who we are here. And uh, we get to look at the arch. Um, right over where you were this morning, I had to chuckle. Um, I think right near the geospatial was Fort San Carlos. And we defeated the British there. They tried to come across the river. So thank goodness we now have Cortex. <laughs> it's, the only, it's, the, it's the only revolutionary battle that was fought on this side of the river. Um, with that, I want to thank you very much. And I would like to ask the ambassador uh, to, to formerly to uh, Ireland, just to say a word or two as well, ambassador to ambassador. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Tatum, it, it was uh, sitting back here in the cheap seats. It was um, <laughs> it was good to see uh, the Union Jack and the Stars and Stripes uh, next to one another. Um, the union of our two countries um, over the centuries since our initial misunderstanding got resolved, um, <laughs> has made the world a better place, has made it more economically prosperous and safer. And so that special relationship that exists between the UK and the United States, may it always, may it always survive. And thank you very much for coming here and, and talking to us and, and telling us a little bit about how, how things are going. Uh, the, two, the two other flags, the flag of Missouri and the flag of St. Louis, um, I, I don't know, Pierce, can we give them 
to Mr. Tatum and ask him to take them back and and uh, <laughs> take them to uh, Washington DC, then take them to Whitehall and remind people uh, in the UK that between New York City and the Silicon Valley, uh, there are a whole bunch of people who would love uh, to host um, UK citizens and UK businesses. We have here a very well-educated and nimble uh, creative workforce, uh, a wonderful style of living, uh, weather today that would remind them of home. And, uh, and I, I think that it would be a, a, a continuation of a prosperous relationship between our two countries. Finally, I know I would never presume to give uh, advice to a professional diplomat like yourself, but I've been told that you are invited to throw out the first pitch mm. today <laughs> at Bush Stadium. So when President Obama nominated me to be the U.S. ambassador to Ireland, I had this similar invitation. Uh, probably unlike you, I have been throwing a baseball around since I was smaller than that table. Uh, and as you know, baseball ain't cricket. So I'll give you some advice on what to do tonight. <laughs> You'll be led out onto the field and you'll stand behind what we call home plate and you'll look out onto what we call the outfield and they'll start talking about you on the PA system. And then all of a sudden you're gonna see your face, uh, <laughs> which is gonna be about the size of the parliament building. On campus, <laughs> and that's gonna be a little bit unnerving. And then they're gonna lead you out to this pile of dirt, which we call the mound. And then the object is to throw the ball from that position 90 feet towards somebody who looks like an ant when you're that far away. So uh, one, of, one of St. Louis's great heroes, so this is not my advice, this is advice from a guy by the name of Bob Gibson, who was one of the best pitchers in the history of baseball and probably one of the best competitors in the history of competition. Bob Gibson said, if you're ever invited to throw out a first pitch, after you reach a certain age, never stand on the mound. So what you should do is when you walk out the 90 feet, walk back about another 20. <laughs> Have one foot on the dirt and one foot on the grass and then throw the ball as best you can. They're gonna film this episode <laughs> and then they're gonna send it to you whether you, <laughs> whether you wanna see it or not. <laughs> And so uh, whatever happens, it will happen. No one will get, no one will get injured, maybe. And, uh, and, and hopefully you'll have a good time watching uh, a game that we really love here. We don't consider Bush, it's called Bush Stadium, but we consider it a cathedral. Uh, it, is a big, it is a big thing for us. I hope you enjoy the game. I truly hope that you'll come back and, and see us again sometime. We're honored uh, by your presence. Uh, we're honored to hear what we're, 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 we benefited from hearing uh, the inside scoop on uh, what the thoughts are of the UK. And uh, as I said before, may, may the association between the United States and the United Kingdom uh, go on forever. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.